Hello. Um, thank you all for coming and joining us today. Uh, I'm Lindsay Ernst. I'm an associate director at the Center for Comparative and Public Law. And it's my pleasure to welcome Delvis Musau here to speak with us today about um, statelessness in the Southeast Asia region and also strategies that are being used right now to address statelessness in the greater Asia region. Um, so he's going to speak with us today and then we'll leave some time in the end for question and answers and are looking forward to discussion, the discussion with all of you as well. Just a little bit of background. I know you could read on the poster uh, some information about Jelvis, but Jelvis Musau is the Senior Regional Protection Officer for Statelessness in Asia, and he's based in Bangkok. Um, and he's here for the week, speaking at many different locations, and we're very happy to be able to have him speaking with us as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lucy. And um, thanks so much for, for your time. I know it's, it's not always very easy to, sp to speak or to, to sit in and listen to someone after lunch. <laughs> but uh, I hope that uh, I can speak as little as possible and listen to you a lot more uh, in terms of any issues or any questions that you might have. Because I think that's the best way to really get what uh, you'd want to, to hear about, not so much what I'd want to speak about. I might want to speak about the things that you don't want to hear about. But uh, just as a way of introduction, uh, as introduced, um, working on statelessness, um, largely in the Southeast Asia region, so I might be a little more focused on Southeast Asia in terms of what's happening. Uh, although in terms of the global and more general regional strategies, we'll talk about what's happening also in the larger Asia Pacific region. Um, The clicker is not clicking, so let me click with the other one. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, technology challenge. Um, just looking at uh, maybe populations, as a way of introduction, sorry, uh, on the populations, we, statelessness, for UNHCR is part of our large mandate, and our mandate is largely on refugees, but status is also part of our mandate. And uh, part of the reason why it was uh, probably, uh, the General Assembly felt that it should be under UNHCR was because quite a number of stateless people were actually also refugees. When you look at the number of forcibly displaced people as of 2017, you'll find that um, we had a lot of internally displaced people 25.4 million refugees, um, 3.1 million asylum seekers, and out of this, I mean, globally, the number of stateless people that we know of, that we've been able to identify, were 3.9 million. And out of those, quite a, a lot of them were either displaced internally or also refugees. But we also have some, a, a lot of uh, uh, stateless people that are neither displaced or refugees. We have population groups that we talk about some of them in the region that are not. And I just started on this because when we've identified 3.9 million, uh, it's just, uh, we, our estimate say that, they, I mean, look at more 10 million or more stateless, stateless people in the world at the moment. So the estimates that we have have actually very small pro proportion of the total number of stateless people that we have globally at the moment. Um, part of the reason why stateless the, the population that we have that we've identified that small is because uh, sometimes statelessness is invisible. Invisible in the sense that you and I don't really know about people that are stateless because it does not affect us. And the people that are stateless themselves would rather that they were not identified in some of the locations where they live in because identification might sometimes bring about uh, protection challenges for them. So when I look at, um, and this, these numbers now relate to the 14 countries that we cover out of Bangkok, because our office, regional office in Bangkok covers uh, Southeast Asia, plus Mongolia, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and East Timor. In that region alone, two point, we, out of the 3.9 million that we just mentioned that have been identified in the world globally, 
2.2 million come from that region. Uh, and why is that number so significant? It's significant because perhaps we are looking at almost 60% of the people that have been identified uh, as stateless in the world being from one small region of it, uh, so one small part of Asia. Um, it's both positive, but it, it's not the entire story. It doesn't mean that uh, there are, we don't have many other stateless people elsewhere in the world. It actually means that identification has not reached at that level. But it's also, and it also does not necessarily mean that Southeast Asia and the, the countries we cover are probably the best at identification. Um, part of the reason why the number is so large is because among these 2.2 million is over a million um, Rohingyas. We know that this is the largest single, most, uh, single stateless uh, group in the world at the moment. At least uh, the Rohingya population with uh, at the moment nine, over 900,000 of them being in Bangladesh, uh, almost half a million in Myanmar. We have around 100,000 in Malaysia, a f uh, large numbers as well in Ind Indonesia and other countries in the region. Uh, this is by far the largest group. Then in Thailand, we have uh, over almost half a million people that have been identified mainly hill tribes in north of Thailand. Uh, these are minority tribes that are moving across the border with uh, Laos and, and, and Myanmar and, other, uh, and the countries that, that, that Thailand borders in the north uh, that were not recognized or that were not, uh, do not have any sort of citizenship of any of the countries. But Thailand has identified them because they are within its territory and Thailand is processing their uh, citizenship as we speak. It's been a process, but since 2008 they've processed over 103,000 of them. So we have numbers there in terms of actually successes in reduction of statelessness that we can really, uh, we, we can tangibly count on uh, as being very significant in the region. So just moving from the numbers then, what 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 are the challenges that we have, or what is statelessness? I think, I'm, I'm sure I don't want to go into details on this one because I know from, from a legal background you've dealt with this. So you know that it's any person who is not considered as a national by any state under the operation of its law. I've sort of underlined some of the elements of that definition that I feel that are very significant, but I'm not going into the details why they're significant because I think that's something that you probably done. Uh, but just in a nutshell is that we are talking about the present century, present, present sense. We are talking about uh, operation of the law, not necessarily the law as it's written. So sometimes when you talk about some of these populations we are talking about, some of them may, on the face of it, not necessarily come out clearly as being stateless, but then when you look a little too further in terms of how the law has been, oper has been operationalized in the countries, then you find that they've not uh, been able to, 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 to uh, gain a nationality in those countries. So I'm also not going to the international legal uh, basis, uh, of background, basis of, on, on issues of statelessness of nationality and the law. <coughs> but in terms of, if you look at, and I'm going to look at this very briefly, and uh, maybe uh, I invite any questions you might have later on. If you look at uh, statelessness in Southeast Asia, in, the, in that in the region generally, not just Southeast Asia, but uh, South, uh, Southeast Asia and the bordering countries, uh, then you look at it probably from four large uh, groups, four large perspectives. Um, firstly, um, and, and the biggest part would be exclusion of minorities, minority groups that are being excluded from nationality or citizenship in the countries where they find themselves. Um, we've seen the Rohingyas. Uh, the Rohingyas were declared under the 1982 um, Myanmar law, nationality law, they actually associate citizens. But then even in the implementation, implementation of that law, they've not really even been able to, uh, to really gain much in terms of uh, traction to attain that as associate citizenship. Um, in Myanmar law, you have hierarchies of citizenship. You have full citizens, uh, you have associate, you have naturalized citizens. So in terms of those hierarchies, they're actually th in the third tier, <laughs> the associate. And um, they, don't still have a, they don't still have access to that. So we could talk about that, but um, 
that already tells you, as a minority there, they are both a religious and probably even racial minority in Myanmar, uh, being that they are Muslims, and even physically they don't look like the normal, I mean, the run-of-the-mill Burmese, then they, they've been excluded, uh, probably for those reasons. There have been, I mean, there are a lot of discussions, there have been discussions since 1982, or even before then, because the previous laws, the pre, prior to 19. 82, the 1948 law in Myanmar sort of identified uh, uh, them as citizens because they, they had been, uh, the Rohingyas have been living in Myanmar for probably close to three decades or beyond. So it's not, it, it, it's, it's a historical issue, but it's also a, a, a discriminatory issue when it comes to their identity as a minority. Um, beyond the Rohingyas in the region, then we have, we've talked about the hill tribes, the small tribes in Thailand. In Cambodia, you have ethnic Vietnamese who are a minority. You have also Khmer Kroms, uh, the uh, Khmers in the north, they're also minorities. In Vietnam itself, you also have uh, uh, minority groups along the border with Laos. So there is almost um, a series of, or one what can call almost an, an issue around minorities in the in, in most of these countries, and it's not just in this region alone. Globally, a lot of other stateless people are minorities. At the moment, we've been looking at nomadic communities, which are also minorities, which have also been affected by statelessness. Uh, in between Thailand and uh, Myanmar border, you have Mokens. That's a group of uh, sea gypsies or sea minorities, sea nomads, who are also a minority across the border. And mostly, at the moment, you can see that they're actually at risk of statelessness, at the least, because most of them don't have documents for other countries. So that's a big theme across uh, Southeast Asia uh, in the region. Then you have also groups that have been affected by migration. And what I would also call others have been affected by contested spaces and territories. <clears throat> in, this, uh, in terms of migration, in Philippines you had the persons of Indonesian descent, or you still have them. And, um, both the Philippine, Philippines government and the Indonesian government have come together to try to resolve this issue through confirmation of nationality, either as Filipinos or as uh, Indonesians. But outside of that, in uh, the Sabah region, the Sulu, uh, sort of archipelago, you have um, Sama, Sama Bajaos, who are also sort of sea gypsies. They move across the region from uh, Eastern Malaysia into Philippines, into Indonesia. And these groups, I mean, these, these communities, they have their identity within the region, not just any territory, any country. Mostly, a lot of them are living in the sea. They're working, they, they move around uh, in, in search of livelihoods in the sea. So for them, the territorial sort of uh, confines did not mean as much. And uh, for the most part, they'd be also at risk of statelessness. But uh, again, the governments in the region, we're working with um, Malaysia. We are looking at also with Philippines, the human rights institutions in the three countries, and also Indonesia, to see how uh, their situation can be addressed. Issues of gender discrimination in nationality laws. Um, that, uh, in, the, in, the, in the global at the moment, there are 25 countries that retain, still retain uh, gender discriminatory uh, provisions in their nationality laws. And two of them would be, in the, re in the region that I'm talking about, Malaysia has uh, some provisions that are discriminatory, and Brunei. And while we are still working with the government there, or the, with the authorities there to review the law, it's affecting populations, it's affecting people that uh, have, for instance, a Malaysian woman who has a child outside, the, outside Malaysia is not able to pass nationality to that child. Malaysian nationality, whereas the male, uh, the male counterpart would be able to do that. So these are some of the provisions that we would, would be looking at. Brunei is similar. So this, 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 these are some of the, provision, the, the, some of the issues in terms of dis discrimination. Then we also have some countries with gaps in nationality laws with respect to child statelessness. Uh, I think, I would say actually most countries, especially when it comes to issues of fundlings, uh, children that are found in a territory uh, whose parents are not known. In uh, Philippines, they had a Supreme Court ruling uh, recently when there was a challenge by 
a candidate for the Senate at the time of presidency at the time. Uh, she, had, she was a foundling herself, uh, but uh, she, her nationality was challenged when she ran for office. They were saying that she's not Filipino. Uh, but um, the Philipp Philippine Supreme Court uh, ruled that um, any person who is found, any child who is found in Philippines is presumed to have a Filipino parent and is thus supreme, also presumed to be a Filipino by, by birth. So that's, 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 I mean, that's very progressive and uh, that's very positive in terms of Philippines, but it's not a provision that is to be found in, on, in almost all, I mean, in all the countries. Some countries have it that uh, foundlings, foundlings in the country, probably people under the age of 12 or whatever age that are found in the country, would be able to be presumed to be nationals of that country. But other countries do not have it, and we, we are working with them uh, to, to see whether we can address these kind of provisions, these kind of uh, uh, gaps in the law. So, I mean, there are other issues in the region, but I would say that this would be the key um, constitutes or the key reasons why we have a bit of statelessness in, in, in the countries that uh, I've just mentioned. Then, in terms of the region, what are the broad strategies when it comes to what, what are we doing uh, with these countries? And I've already sort of addressed a lot of that. But uh, at the very general level, uh, we have, uh, uh, because we have like four main pillars that we work with when we talk about statelessness, uh, these are identification, reduction, prevention, and, and, and uh, protection. It, when it comes to uh, identification, we're actually doing that across the region because much as we say that uh, we have numbers, we also know that, and uh, like I mentioned from the start, uh, statelessness is an issue which many times could also see, still remains invisible. There are many people that do not even want to talk about it. So the identification is ongoing. We work with, uh, we're trying to work with UNFPA, the, the, that's a UN uh, 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 agency that deals with statistics, sometimes with uh, population statistics, census, and others. And working with the countries like Indonesia and others who have censuses coming up soon to ensure that they have questions or they have queries that relate to nationality so that we can be able to identify and see whether there are statelessness issues that are not identified in those in those countries. But then there are also other strategies including surveys where there are populations that are suspected of being stateless. In terms of reduction, um, Thailand, because it already has numbers, it already has identified and has registered people that are stateless, is actually working towards reduction. Um, as of um, June this year, half of the year, they had already actually processed close to 10,000 applicants for, for nationality, and they, they were able to, to, to grant them uh, Thai nationality. Probably most of us had, or most of, some of you might have read about the cave boys, or the, the story of the cave boys earlier on, uh, positives that came out of a tragedy. I mean, these boys were trapped for almost two weeks in a cave, but then it was found three of them were stateless. But later on, they were able to, to be granted nationality. So that's something that we're working a lot in Thailand. In Malaysia as well, we had, uh, they had identified over 12,000 persons of uh, Indian descent, uh, Indian descent who had uh, moved into Malaysia during the colonial period, um, working in the farms, in the mines, but they were not uh, granted nationality, or they, they've been living there for probably third generation with no nationality. But uh, they are now in the process of uh, granting nationality to these people. But this was mainly in Western Malaysia. In Philippines, I talked about the persons of, 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 of Indonesian descent. Out of 8,700 that had been identified, over 6,700 have actually already been granted nationality. So it's, it's a process that is moving on quite positively as well. When it comes to prevention, uh, prevention of statelessness is likely about the law reform to ensure that the laws do not have gaps uh, that uh, would probably lead to statelessness. We talked about issues to do with um, gender discrimination, uh, lack of protection for foundlings, perhaps um, laws that uh, have problems in terms of documentation. So we are working a lot on that with, uh, we, we're working with Cambodia for instance at the moment to, on uh, review of their laws uh, laws on civil registration and vital statistics, birth registration especially. We're working with them to 
in the future look at their also nationality law, their, their, their citizenship law, because it has had, in the past it's been uh, very uh, ethnic oriented, mere ethnic oriented. So we're looking at um, a situation where they look at persons within the territory who are entitled to uh, Cambodian nationality being able to be granted Cambodian nationality. Um, then in Vietnam as well, Vietnam is looking at uh, um, minorities, but also there had been cases of Vietnam, again, issues of laws, gaps in the laws, where in the past the law provided that people that left uh, Vietnam would not be able to, or that women that had been married to non-Vietnamese lost their nationality because you had to denounce your Vietnamese nationality to move to another country or to get another nationality. And there are quite many of them, and some of them, there were quite a lot, I mean, uh, there were divorces. So those that came back were effectively stateless, and we've had a big group that now, with changes in the law, have been able to, be re to regain the Vietnamese nationality. On protection, um, ideally should be across any population groups that have are stateless. We've been um, in the only country in the region that has uh, sort of in that region that I'm talking about that has a uh, a legal framework for protection of stateless persons would be Philippines, which is the only country in that region which is a part of the 1954 Convention on the Status of Stateless Persons. They've, um, they've also enacted, uh, through probably uh, departmental circulars, procedures for determining status determination, uh, status, uh, statelessness status of my people coming into Philippines. So they are quite advanced, and they have a national action plan to end statelessness by 2024. So they are doing quite well in terms of, as a country, taking ownership of this issue, and we're working with them, providing technical and material support in, 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 in this issue that they are doing. So, but then again, when it comes to protection, we're also working very, uh, we, we rely a lot on uh, the normal human rights uh, sort of, uh, uh, human rights law, human rights framework of protection. You know about probably general comment number 15 of the Human Rights Council talks about protection of aliens and protection of people uh, within the territory, irrespective of their nationality. So we look at that and we, we try to work with countries to ensure that, that protection, the protection mechanisms uh, is extended to, 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 to stateless persons. So. That's what I just wanted to say in terms of uh, the statelessness, largely with a focus in Southeast Asia. But at a larger, at more general level in Asia generally, uh, we have um, along those same sort of uh, strategies, we have frameworks, we have arrangements. Like we have arrangements with uh, UNICEF uh, on a coalition on, on every child's right to nationality. To ensure that children are born, are born without, I mean, are not born into statelessness. Uh, to ensure that every child is able to gain some nationality, because the CRC provides for it anyway, that every child should be able to attain nationality at birth. So this coalition we, uh, has, uh, has been translated into national strategies uh, in various countries where we work with UNICEF to try to ensure that birth registration is done to ensure that uh, laws and frameworks, uh, administrative frameworks, are conducive to children attaining uh, nationality. Uh, at the moment, uh, I know that we have such joint strategies in Philippines, in Thailand, and um, I believe in, uh, yeah, in Cambodia. But other countries are also working on that, at least in this larger region. Then we, I mentioned that we are working with UNFPA, we are working with um, UN Women to ensure that there is no discrimination in uh, gender discrimination in national nationality laws. We work with academic institutions, especially to uh, to to for, for research into who the stateless people are, what are the issues on statelessness, to research and look at the gaps in the laws in the countries uh, where 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 they, 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 there might be uh, issues of statelessness. And recently in this region, I'm just talking about uh, the fact that in Australia now we have uh, a center for statelessness, the Peter McMullen Center for Statelessness in the University of Melbourne, which is going to be from next year, February, offering uh, an intensive course. I mean, they're, they're actually 
a dedicated to statelessness, but they'll be offering a one-week intensive course in statelessness uh, akin to the one that we have in Tilburg University from the Institute of Statelessness and, and Inclusion. And um, I would, if you are interested in the subject, I would actually encourage that you look into what they are doing because I think it's, you have uh, people, they, they actually, they are going to be, their focus is going to be on Asia and Pacific. So you have uh, academics there who are really dedicated on these issues, in these issues. I've got some materials that uh, if you are really interested in the subject, you can look at. Uh, it's in a uh, Word document, uh, which is, which I'll put in a while, up in a while, but then can also be left for anyone who wants to look at it, to uh, look at that. It's, it looks at, it's materials likely that we've done as UNHCR, but we also looked at others uh, for the materials. But that's what I had as, a preface to any questions or any discussions that we might have. I must say that when it comes to questions and discussions, I hope I have colleagues here, Ambrose, <laughs> Philip, and uh, others, if uh, I, I will be ready to receive any questions that there may be. Thank you very much. I'll open it up to you all now for some questions. Does anybody have any questions? Um, you mentioned that one of the strategies to um, tackle stagnancy in the region is reduction and for people to acquire citizenship in countries like Thailand and Malaysia and it seems like it's going pretty well. So I was just wondering what's the incentive for governments to do that? Like, is it because of their respect for human rights, international law, or is there um, any other considerations? A very good question. <laughs> um, I think one of the key is, I mean, okay, uh, I don't want to go to the theoretical basis for a state, <laughs> but I, I think one of the keys, when you look at practically in those, in those uh, governments, in those regions, we, we always argue that um, it's important for government to know anyone, everyone in its territory, even from, from a, uh, from a, Let's start with security because most of them start with security perspective. From a development perspective, we, we now know from even the SDGs that no one should be left behind. We need everyone, at least to account for what everyone is able to do, what everyone is uh, is contributing to the to the to the to the um, territory or to the to the jurisdiction. In the situation of the countries that you're mentioning in, in this region, you find that these are populations that have actually have some connections to those countries, traditionally. So that could be an incentive. Uh, they not only have uh, connections to those countries, but actually people that are living in those territories, especially when you look at the minorities. It's not that this, they came from elsewhere to, into those territories, they, or at least not in the recent past. Even if you talk about uh, the contested Rohingyas. These are people that Rohingyas have been in Myanmar for decades, not not one decade, two decades, probably even beyond. I mean, not decades, actually centuries. Um, so these are people that have been in the territories for so long that you cannot really claim that they belong elsewhere. So at the end of the day, I think there's there's a the, you can say there's a moral, there's a legal basis, there's a, there's there's an economic social basis for the state to recognize these persons as their nationals. For the most part, when you look at statelessness across the world, it's not so much, and I don't think that it's, it's, it's an issue which, for the most part, has been caused by sometimes discrimination which might be inadvertent, not necessarily very, very uh, I mean, not, not a, necessarily something that the government set out to do. Uh, sometimes it's been caused by, re I mean, most of the reasons have been inadvertent. There are some few situations whereby you find that the reasons have been because probably players in the, the, the government do not want a particular group of people or do not want some particular uh, persons to belong. But largely, I mean, any government would rather have its pe the people that are within its territories that they don't have a problem with being accounted to for as its citizens, and if, especially if they have connections. In terms of Malaysia, in terms of Thailand, that's a situation. Uh, I think their biggest motivation is because they recognize, and in Malaysia they actually did, uh, through the previous government, has a, has a blueprint 
for recognizing Malay, Malay Indians. And it was a campaign promise that the, that the current government also had. So they do recognize politically it's good for them. Uh, Security-wise, it's good for them. Economically, it's good for them. So for the most part, we build, our work now becomes really working with them to identify their interests when it comes to the populations in that respect. Obviously, sometimes we have cases that are a bit more complex. The Rohingya is one of them where we have a situation where in Myanmar, it's still very difficult, to say the least. Um, it's, it's, it's still an intractable situation, although every player, and it, from the Rakhine Commission report and others, recognize that nationality is, is going to be one of the key reasons to uh, not only peace in the, in the country, but also uh, to, 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 to ensuring that there's development in Myanmar. So I think it's a development issue, it's a political issue, it's in their political interest, it's in their security interest, in their economic interest to, to, to cognize them. Thank you very much for your talk. I wonder if you could say a little bit about the distinction between de jour and de facto statelessness, and particularly whether you feel facto statelessness is being uh, is a ground for protection, particularly non reformal protection. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'd say a very <laughs> one of the, the questions I was hoping to avoid. <laughs> Not seriously though. Um, but yeah, I think the the, the, the distinction really uh, you obviously, by law, stateless is where it's very clear that the law provides and or the operation of the law is such that people are stateless, uh, that, and, and it's, it's clear in that. Uh, the, the fact of stateless is populations which cannot effectively access the benefits of nationality from the countries which they are connected to. Um, there has been arguments that probably de facto statelessness is not really strictly stateless. stateless. And... Um, it's, a, it's an argument which, uh, like you said, and I think you used a very, very, in my opinion, the most important aspect of it is protection. If you are not able to gain or to access the benefits of the nationality of your I mean, this, this, the, the nationality, then you are not able to really gain that protection. But then, if what if that country nominally um, sort of, uh, what, what if the country nominally recognizes you as its citizen? Does that truly mean that you're actually not stateless as such? I think it's something that probably needs to be looked at probably a lot more academically. We were looking at this in the context of uh, sometimes the Afghans in, uh, in Pakistan, for instance, or in Iran. Um, you have third generation, second generation Afghans. Afghanistan has never uh, claimed that these are not their citizens. But Afghanistan is both unwilling and some, I mean, mainly unable, but at times even unwilling to provide, to extend protection. A lot of these are refugees for the most part. And they gain protection as refugees, but what if they are not refugees? What if, um, then what would we then have for them? Would we then have a category whereby we're looking at them as people at the risk of statelessness? Who, are, who then should be protected and should be able to be supported to access the rights and the, the rights that uh, that uh, that they should have as Afghan nationals. We've we've tried to look at it from that context of protection in most of the parts where they are not refugees. Uh, where they are refugees, we try to look at them first and foremost as refugees, which deserve protection as refugees, and who whose nationality issue comes in only when they are looking at return, the possibility of return. So that now at that point, you know, at the point where we're looking at uh, agreements for return, we, we, act, we actually, for the most part as UNHCR, ensure that we have a provision for nationality, access, access to nationality rights upon return. So that's how we've sort of handled that situation. Uh, but um, the dichotomy is very thin, especially where the country has nominally accepted that these are still its citizens, but it's not able or willing to provide that, uh, that protection. Um, 
interest in the in the topic you talk about uh, the sea gypsies, like about in the uh, Philippines, uh, uh, the, the arrangement between the government they talk uh, they talk about the the uh, sea gypsies. Uh, so uh, these sea gypsies. Uh, uh, do they have the right to refuse the, to be any of the citizens of these countries? And if uh, uh, they have the right to refuse to, uh, to any citizens of these governments, uh, then uh, will they have the right to stick to their lifestyles, like uh, still living in the, in the, in the free wear, not settled in one countries? Thank you. <laughs> Um, it's, it's an interesting issue that you raise as well. Thank you very much for that question. Um, it's been, there's um, a scholar, uh, she's, uh, what's her name? Helen Brandt has done quite some research on this issue. And she's uh, talked to a lot of the sea gypsies in that region. And that was an issue that some were raising that they prefer their lifestyle. Some did not want to be sort of confined to a territory. But then, we find that there is, a, 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 when it comes to nationality, at least they need to have an identity with some territory, even though issues of movement, now immigration issues could be addressed separately from the nationality issue. Because when it talks about, when, when you talk about most of them, most of them, yes, they want to, to say to, to belong to some country, but that belonging for them should not, uh, ideally should not restrict them from having to go out into the sea and look for livelihoods in regions that are not within their country. So it's it's been an issue where the discussions, actually part of the discussions that we've had in the past has been around uh, unpacking what are the issues, what are the uh, immigration issues involved, what are the nationality issues. Uh, unfortunately, in, it, it's way more complicated than that because Philippines even has uh, some uh, territorial claim of a part of what is now Sabah region in Malaysia. So there are security implications, there are political issues, so all those have to be addressed. <laughs> the, the three governments basically have to come on to an agreement. And you know with the incursion, or if you read about uh, that region, you know that uh, in 2013 there was an incursion from parts of Mindanao into uh, Sabah region in Malaysia by some groups that were claiming autonomy of the Sulu, what they call the Sulu state. So that being the case then, um, there might, I mean, this, that could have been probably an easier issue if we didn't have all those other considerations. You have security considerations that have to be dealt with, border control, border, border management issues, and then you have um, also political claims that, has to be, that, that need to be addressed. So the, 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 the line that we've been following lately is, would be um, or the line that many of them would prefer is that they have a connection to a, to a state and then they address issues of immigration, move, uh, freedom of movement across the borders be addressed separately from the nationality issues so that we don't conflate the two and then you have a problem where they don't, have, don't, they don't even have any identity with any of the states in the region. In terms of whether they have a right to refuse <laughs> now that's that, I think that would be addressed uh, through uh, the process of whether they'll be given the choice of deciding which of the states that they may want to belong to. Uh, the experience that we had with persons of Indonesian descent in Philippines was actually pretty, it was pretty good, I would say, good practice in the sense that persons were actually given a choice. They were based in Philippines territory, yes, but they were given a choice because most of them had come from Indonesia a while ago, years ago. They were given a choice to choose whether they want they would want to eventually go back to Indonesia or whether they would want to be Filipinos. Again, this was a small group, but the choice was given to them. Uh, in an ideal situation, the choice should always be there, to sort of, or should should ideally be there because these people have been in the region for for as long as uh, they, they've had connections to probably the region generally, not just in particular part of the region. But um, it's not something that we can answer. I think it's something that is would have to be discussed, <laughs> whether they'll be granted that choice. Uh, I'm sure probably one or two governments might not have a problem, but I'm not too sure that Malaysia will not have a problem because most of them are actually in Malaysia. <laughs> Thank you.
you. Hi, <coughs> Gab. Uh, you were talking about the issue mostly in uh, developing countries, and I was wondering if developed country has to deal with the issue of statelessness within this territory, not as a within this territory, is this a concept that they should have attend to? Thank you very much. Another very good question. And I'm sorry that it seems to be very much on, I was actually focusing on the countries I've been working on a lot, and most of them are developing countries. But uh, at global level, we've actually had this as a problem also in, uh, in Europe, actually, generally. Uh, the Roma, especially, as a community, is, um, is one of those nomadic communities in, in Europe that is discriminated against. There are minorities in many places. And they are, I would say, almost de facto stateless. If you go into the Middle East, the Bedouins in Kuwait, um, I would say that Kuwait, Kuwait is developed by any, any sort of, most of the indicators, but uh, the Bedouins have been stateless for quite a while and they're excluded. So you also find that in uh, developed countries. Uh, some of them, again, also in terms of uh, uh, exclusions, I mean, also uh, gaps in the laws, especially in terms of foundlings. You find those gaps even in developed countries. So that children born in, in territories, uh, perhaps like this one, which might be developed, who, whose parents are not to be found, um, may be stateless. I would say that in, in the region that we cover, Singapore has had some quite some cases of uh, statelessness because of, again, some of those gaps in the laws, uh, whereby children born in uh, Singapore of parents that are not, uh, that are found links, but not necessarily be automatically recognized as Singaporeans. So it's, it's there across, the, across the, the globe generally. Um, maybe some of the bigger groups would be found. I mean, we are looking at the ones that are very visible in, in this region. I'll say that the, only, the region that is actually making most progress now on issues of statelessness of us, made, made a lot of progress would be South, uh, Latin America, largely because most of the countries in Latin America follow the Jusoli principle of recognition uh, as nationals. So if anyone bo is born in the territory, they, 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 they have a right, or they have automatic right to be nationals of that country, for most of the countries in South America. But this is not the situation probably with most of the rest of the world. So uh, the gaps, especially gaps in laws, that, that issue and discrimination would, would be found in most of the regions, including in developed countries. Is that one of the areas that you're pushing or that you, got, you would advocate for? You're working with governments here, countries here, to change because you've just recognized that Latin America seems to be able to make advances because they have birthright just by being born in the territory. How are you guys dealing with that in Southeast Asia? Uh, thank you. Again, it's as a best practice here, yes, so it's one of the issues that uh, we would uh, encourage. Uh, we, we do when we do uh, advocacy work with, with the governments, we do encourage them to, 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 to consider that. Um, we do recognize, again, being an issue that is, I mean, Nationality being an issue within the uh, the sovereign sort of jurisdiction of the state, uh, a lot of countries will argue that probably in their territory. I mean, many of the countries we, we have been a bit hesitant to go that direction. Although when you look at most of the laws in the region, they have a mix of a bit with the principle, especially upon. Um, uh, for the people that uh, at independence, and then Jusanguinis uh, subsequently. But we are trying to see, and some of them even had Jusanguinis like principles, but they didn't, they said at some point not to follow it up. So we try to encourage that as much as possible as a good practice. Um, it's a bit of a challenge, uh, but um, where it works, I think it's, it's very positive because then again, it's, it resolves the issue of childhood statelessness. Because any person born in the territory then is at no risk of being stateless, at, at least at birth, uh, because at birth they already are guaranteed on the nationality of that state. Peter. Um, for a refugee claimant who is uh, de jure uh, stateless, and from the uh, perspective of an adjudicator, I'm just wondering what is the most perplexing or difficult legal hurdle for that particular claimant to cross, aside from what you just mentioned already in relation to uh, return? Um, what The way we approach it from UNICEF uh, largely, especially in terms of um, guidelines, 
we try to look at the refugee claim first. I mean, if somebody comes in us and we, we recognize that they have also stateless claim, we look at the, the refugee uh, claim first. And once that is resolved, then um, we would look at in terms of solutions and we'll consider this, the statelessness component. Uh, so much so that uh, like the solution may not lie in uh, going back. It, it could be a solution ultimately, especially if, if uh, nationality is guaranteed or citizenship, uh, the, the pathways to citizenship are open in that country. But that only comes in when it comes now. We're looking at the solutions, definitely the statelessness component becomes critically important. But in terms of protection, uh, the protection uh, or uh, the protection framework that is offered by a refugee status is pretty similar to that that is offered under statelessness. The two conventions, 54, 51 conventions, almost word for word. So, in terms, of, especially in terms of their provisions of uh, uh, access to the rights and, uh, and freedoms, so the protection framework is pretty much similar. So we look at the refugee protection but then look at solutions at the level of uh, the nationality. Uh, I, in terms of the challenge, in, uh, when you're looking at um, the challenge when you're looking at the claim, you are right, especially when somebody gives, I mean, th there's going to be a lot, sometimes I think it, it's, it becomes a question of now of uh, establishing, the establishment of facts and all that becomes a lot, probably sometimes a lot more difficult for someone who is claiming that they are stateless well, from their place, uh, from where they, they, they came from, because we're talking about someone who has probably f fled from somewhere else. Uh, in that situation, I think those again are the difficulties that now have to be looked at within the context of the refugee status determination process. Uh, Philippines, which has a uh, status determination process, actually has guidelines along this exactly the same lines I'm talking about, when they, they identify a claim that has both statelessness and refugee claim, they process the refugee claim first. If the person is not successful as a refugee, then they process the statelessness claim. So that person has two layers of sort of uh, protection. If you don't get protected as a refugee, then they get protected as a stateless person. And that's what we encourage, because then, then that way, at least they, one way or the other, especially if any of those claims is proved, they, they're able to get the protection. <laughs> so um, the principle of family unity that is sometimes applied in refugee claims, do you think that also applies uh, in, in the context of protection of stateless people, particularly in the context where you have a family where clearly one person is stateless, but maybe others are not. Could one apply the principle of family unity? Again, <coughs> thanks so much. <laughs> this is very useful as a question uh, in terms of, uh, um, I, I, when we look at, um, as Eunice here, we encourage it. And uh, we, as a principle, we say that, uh, we, we, we push it for, for principle of family unity. Uh, and family, not unity for, uh, for the, to, to the detriment of those that have nationality. <laughs> but again, unity at the most favorable, protective uh, uh, status possible, which is obviously nationality. And um, obviously that has its challenges because again, especially in a situation whereby somebody has been uh, stripped of nationality for some reason, it becomes really difficult for the same state which strips this person of nationality to to be the to be one that we can approach with uh, arguments for family unity <laughs> and to to probably grant nationality on, for for this person on the basis of, of of family unity. But then, in terms of when you're looking at solution for this person who's stateless, then we would have to look at it in the context of the family unity. We obviously, and I think part of our law reform is to discourage situations whereby states will or states are strip uh, arbitrarily uh, deny somebody or strip of nationality from individuals because these are situations whereby you, the situation that you described sort of appears a lot more. But we know that it happens, so that's why we also have these principles in terms of uh, protection where we're looking at. Uh, looking at the larger human rights uh, framework, 
looking at the most protective uh, standards, norms available and trying to apply those in looking for solutions for either the sales person or at least to ensure that this, uh, the principle of family duty is, is, uh, is maintained. <coughs> Thank you, Jelvis. Does it, do we have any other questions? I get to ask the last question. <laughs> I get to reserve one for myself. Um, I'm just curious because you're talking about the gaps in the law, and it seems that when you're working with countries to try and to Elizabeth's question of countries being resistant to changing legislation, do you find, or countries that are more open to legislation, do you find that there's also gaps in research or in data collection around this area? And you talked a little bit, and I'd love just to end on what are some things that research institutions could be doing or UNHCR could be working with people and communities to do in terms of raising awareness or bringing background information, collecting data, bringing out the information about what's going on in terms of statelessness issues? Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> You That's better than Simon's question. No, 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 sorry. All the questions have been amazing. I'm sorry, Jill. No, and, and I've been, thank you so much for this. It's engaging and it's really exciting for me. And I hope that I'm not skimming over issues so much that we're not really at least addressing some of the questions that you're asking uh, properly. Uh, but uh, thank you very much because, again, this is probably what part of our work, <laughs> what, what we, we love to do with uh, institutions and with, because uh, we, we, we do find, yes, there's a lot in terms of gaps in the laws. Uh, and we do, as UNHCR, we do not have, I don't, I don't, uh, as ourselves, we don't have the capacity to really do this. We, are, we, we recognize first that we are not the only experts in this issue. In fact, we are not the experts because a lot of the experts would be probably in the academic field on a lot of this issues that we talk about. We just happen to be sort of a bridge and uh, uh, the, the, the organization that has been granted the mandate to sort of coordinate the efforts in, 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 uh, in, in working in these issues of reduction and ending statelessness. So one of the things that um, one of, uh, and I've just probably, uh, my background, I've worked in refugee protection and in protection work we didn't see for a long time, it's been mentioned. And most of the places you find we've had a bit of protection, a bit of statelessness. Uh, but, and I'll even on up with UNSCR, within UNSCR, I think refugees has always been sort of a first priority. <laughs> and stateless is somewhere behind, although it's still part of our mandate. So one of the things that we've done, especially uh, since the global campaign started, we have a global campaign to end statelessness within 10 years. It started in 2014. Um, it's a very ambitious campaign. We already realize it's ambitious because we're almost getting halfway point through the campaign, which is next year, 2019, will be five years since the campaign started. And um, there's been a lot of progress since the campaign started. There's been a lot of reaction, a lot of positive reaction to the, what the campaign goals are, which is looking at statelessness and trying to end statelessness. The campaign has 10 goals, uh, ident including identification, ending childhood statelessness, looking at uh, issues to do with gender discrimination, uh, documentation for those that are entitled to them, national documentation, looking at issues of um, uh, birth uh, registration, statistics, accession to the conventions. And in, a lot of, in all these action points, we've had a lot of progress. But you also realize that by it, it's not, sometimes it, it, there's so much to be done. Um, we've gone too much. The point I'm trying to make is that we can't do this alone. <laughs> and we don't have the capacity alone. Globally, statelessness in UNHCR is underfunded. We don't have as much resource. So we work a lot with other institutions, especially academic institutions, research institutions. Uh, we are even trying to uh, put together, actually, uh, uh, an inventory of all these um, uh, partners who work with NGOs. In Malaysia, we've actually had a fantastic job that has been done by an NGO uh, in identifying the stateless, stateless Indians communities. Uh, in, um, in Thailand itself, in North Thailand, we have paralegal, an NGO which is providing paralegal support. 
uh, to applicants for nationality because you might be identified as stateless, but then there are also documentation is processes, and a lot of these processes are legal, and um, most of these people do not really know what where to start. So we need to work with these communities, community-based organizations, paralegals, and others to help them to 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 do as much as possible. Gaps of the laws. In in fact, I'd say. I would actually say uh, authoritatively that we don't know half of what we need to know <laughs> as we speak in terms of uh, the laws, gaps. I'd even started look, putting something on an infographic. You're talking about gaps of the laws in, in the region that you're talking about. And uh, we would definitely that we work a lot with uh, academic institutions. We've been trying to promote even internships where we can. Uh, with law students and others to support us in this work, to work with them in this uh, in this area that might be interested. So we're working with academics, in, and academics have been extremely instrumental sometimes in, in advancing research, which has helped our ad advocacy with governments, for them to know that this is not a dangerous issue, you're dealing with actually development, you're dealing with security, you're dealing with the people, populations in your territory that you need to know of, so that you can be able to do this and this and this and this. So, Academic institutions have been extremely useful in that, in looking at the um, gaps in the laws, in sometimes even framing, uh, taking consideration of uh, the local situations, framing uh, reforms, or framing, uh, because Cambodia, for instance, uh, they've been asking us to help them with uh, reform, uh, reform of their civil registration laws. We need to understand the uh, local situation before we're able to to help them with anything. We might have best practices that we could share from different locations across the globe, but then we also need to look at peculiar situations in the different, in the different and, and that's sometimes the role that is played by researchers within those countries, or researchers looking at the re regions rather than looking at um, uh, the glo global picture. At the moment, we, we, uh, we are globally uh, having a collaboration, and this is not just from UNHCR level, it's actually from the Secretary General of UN, because for him, statelessness is also a, a one of the, his biggest priorities to, to address. Well, it, does, it helps that he was our UNHCR High Commissioner <laughs> until, I think, uh, until last year. But um, he also recognizes, actually, from the SDGs that uh, the issue of leaving no one behind uh, goal number, I mean, goal number 16.9, that uh, legal identity and, and nationality for all is, is extremely important. <coughs> so there is a research looking at um, nomadism and statelessness, and um, this research is being uh, carried out uh, in collaboration with the university, I just mentioned, University of Melbourne. Uh, the, 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 it, it's probably one of many that will be carried out and locally we do that carry out research and uh, collaboration a lot. I know in Myanmar we've had a lot of research. We had one with Mandalay University and others. Despite the fact that in Myanmar they have very limited space for research. Even the universities, I mean, they are, a bit, they are quite restricted. But we do have research institutions and we do work with them quite a lot because then we are able to actually have evidence facts, data that we can use in terms of in our advocacy, and even in terms of uh, uh, working with countries themselves that might want to effect change in their policies, in their administrative processes, in their laws. So extremely, extremely important. Um, and that's why for us, this is probably one of, I mean, especially my role, this is one of the most important engagements, being able to engage with the uh, academic institutions and uh, uh, getting uh, your input, your views, your, your, because mostly your objective, because mostly, I mean, from the academics, you get things, objective facts. You don't, it's not the same sometimes where advocacy is all about the emotional reaction to the situation. So this becomes extremely important, and uh, we would really appreciate working with you. Thank you. Thank you, Delvis, and I do just want to conclude on that. I see all of you here, and I think Delvis's response to this last question is really important for all of us to think about, and that I'm looking around and I see colleagues and pro bono lawyers who I've worked with and students, and UNHCR does welcome and appreciate any support and ways that everybody can contribute, and I know that we've had students who've done internships with UNHCR, 
and UNHCR is still always op open and looking for interns from here, so I do welcome all of you to reach out to me if you would like contact information or information. And also UNHCR has worked with us on doing a stateless report about the gaps in the law in Hong Kong, which UNHCR is now using. So please do continue to think about the ways that you can get involved and do reach out to us at the Center for Comparative and Public Law or at UNHCR to get involved and work on this issue. So thank you, Jelvis. Thank you very much.